So I read a dissertation, it blew my mind. And um, basically, I got some seed funding from a friend of mine and started the journey. So how, how do you kind of negotiate the legalities around starting to grow hemp? Because I'd imagine they probably have some kind of statute against it. No, not at all. Hemp's been growing in the UK since 1993. It grows everywhere in Europe. You, there's 16 varieties on the EC list. I mean, hemp is a crop. The problem is it's not subsidised or funded. So, and agriculture at the moment is very much about subsidies and, and what, what wants to be... It's all controlled. Not at all. Hemp's been so growing to in the UK suddenly since grow 1993. Crop, it grows you everywhere have a lot in of money. Europe. That's you, really the bottom line to it. I mean, you can get a home office I mean, hemp is free. a crop. You need to be a bona fide company, you need to work with the Home Office, they'll obviously do checks on you. Um, We grew with the universities in 2007, we grew with De Montfort University and um, Hadley College and Emerson Biodynamic College in Forest Row. So obviously they were bona fide organisations, so it was easy to get the um, hemp, we were to get the hemp licence, but... I, th- I think it's very political uh, why hemp's not being grown and, and needs a home office license. And, and once people become aware of, of the real situation, it, it, it won't last that much longer. It's, it's just, if you grew for marijuana, you wouldn't grow for hemp. It's just, you, for marijuana, you grow for the leaf, the bud, and for hemp, you grow for the seed or the stem. So yeah. if you had a, a hemp field... It would look bizarre to grow marijuana in between the hemp field because the hemp field you're growing for seeds is a totally different way you would grow it. Absolutely. You know, so so in the as soon as it this becomes known and more hemp's grown, is that that whole myth's going to go because it's you just wouldn't grow you just would grow it totally differently. You you trim it differently. Everything's totally different. The whole gen, the whole gen, the whole by the whole uh, growth of it the ag- ag- agronomy. Of growing hemp to grow on grow on marijuana is totally different. So, but there's not enough hemp growing, and there's not enough uh, people lobbying for it. And there's not enough information out there for it to be, you know, seriously lobbied in Parliament. But that's my dream. My dream is to be growing loads of hemp here, um, having a hemp factory, and uh, you know, get, getting it back on the planet so we can start really making things from hemp. At the moment, it's just all too expensive, and the reason, one of the reasons why it's expensive, is there's not a big enough demand for it. Yeah. There's very little demand for the hemp, and because there's no real demand for it, it's, people don't know, they only know it as a fibre crop, but they certainly don't know it as a seed crop, um, that is really good for you. It's like one of the most nutritious seeds on the planet, if not the most nutritious seed on the planet. And they even say that Buddha lived on one hemp seed a day for seven years. I mean, hemp is, 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 is really a, an amazing... It has the perfect balance of omega... The perfect balance of omega-3, 6, and 9. Your nine amino acids, um, essential fatty acids, and, and really key vitamins and minerals, very low cholesterol. And um, they were curing children of tuberculosis in 1952 in Czechoslovakia, just using hemp seed to boost the immune system. It's, it's breast milk. It's the closest thing to breast milk. Hemp milk is the closest thing to breast milk. I mean, it's, it's perfectly set for us, and it's very high in globular protein, which is a protein that we need, humans need, for, to get, you know, um, for our blood cells and stuff. Uh, globular protein is the best thing for the human body, and hemp provides it in spades, I mean, like, hugely. So... It's all about really re-education of people realizing the importance of hemp. But the farmers will only grow it if they know there's a demand for it and there's going to be money out of it. So the, the aim is to get as many people buying the products as possible because by buying them, then we can start. See, the thing is, I'm not going to get money. We're not going to get money from the, from the government. And they're not going to subsidize hemp. And actually, our farmers lost the subsidy. Well, we had to pay their subsidy because they lost the subsidy for growing hemp. So, and this particular hemp seed variety, and it was all, it's all really politically, you know, uh, tight in regards to that. For example, the seed we, grew, we used to grow was called Fenola, um, and it was tested quite late in the autumn, and the THC levels were higher than if it had been tested at the beginning of the season. So it was like something like 0.035 or 0.04, which is like one tiny percent above the uh, recommended um, you know, THC dose, which is 0.3%. Uh-huh. And, um, and so the, the guy who owns the seed, because what happens is that you own the seed, the company owns the seed rights. So you have a company right. that owns the seed rights. He complained that they had tested it quite late, and it was the French who had tested it. Now the French make their own seed. 
<laughs> and they had their own seed product, so there's obviously a bit of competition there. And yeah. so what they did was that they stuck it onto the EC list, but they said, you, but if you grow it, you lose a subsidy. So they allowed it, but they made it almost financially impossible. Right, yeah. So what's essentially required here is a, a huge marketing campaign to get the awareness yes. out there. Exactly, right. and people actually buying it. I mean, the thing is, is that I've, it's been really hard getting into shops because it's hemp, and we've brought out a brand new product, hemp porridge, which is amazing. But people don't know it; they don't. It's, it's unique. And what I've really um, worked out, uh, having done this for so long, is that it's it's a real bugger to go in, into distribution. Um, we, food retail is a nightmare right now, um, especially organic, healthy foods. Um, just because the margins are so tight, it's ridiculously tight for a very small company which doesn't have much investment to go break into the marketplace now on food, is is super tough because you're competing against I mean really big brands that are that have all the marketing budgets and everything. So I've worked out that it's going to be it's going to take a hemp campaign, yeah. and word of mouth to make it work, and it's going to be have to be through the internet. Because it's certainly, I can't compete with any of the brands that are coming out, and and unless you and, and a lot of the brands that start really small get get um, bought out really easily by another company that's bigger than them that follows you up. And Amaru is a vision; it's not it's not a brand of food. It's a it's a, a community based empowerment, starting with the food and you know ending up in biogas. You know what I mean? Biodiesel or hemp plastics. <laughs> yeah. You know the list is endless. The list is endless. We could be doing everything. So it's not. It's not about making a quick buck and selling it on. I mean, this is a. Uh, this is my path. You know, it's the hemp path, but it's getting the the rusty wheel turning again, oiling it, oiling it with the seed. <laughs> Excellent. Here with Dean Rose and Simon John Wood and Rebecca Sherman Bloom. So we were just talking there before the song about. Um, your Amaru hemp brand, which is uh, primarily food that you're selling. I've noticed when I looked on your the Amaru site, it's pretty much um, it's all all is a, nu- a nutrition like food that you're selling. But are there any other kind of hemp products you're selling? Because hemp it's a very versatile plant. Probably is one of the most, if not the most versatile plant there is, and it, it, you can make so many different things out of it. Are you using the rest of the plant for other materials? Well, I mean, th- this is an interesting question because. Um, originally, we grew for fibre. In the UK, um, hemp was uh, primarily a fibre crop. Um, in fact, it was illegal not to grow hemp in, in under Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. A quarter of an acre of your land had to be hemp, and it was so valuable you could uh, pay your taxes with it. And the reason what this was was because um, Christopher Columbus uh, travelled around the world, you know, under Elizabeth I was because the sh- all the ships were made from hemp, or the majority of the hip- ships were made from hemp. Canvas comes from the word cannabis because it's the only seafaring fabric. Um, a lot of the fabric was stuffed in between the the, um, the panels of the boats to make it waterproof. And uh, all the ropes were made from hemp. And uh, it's, um, hemp is stronger than steel. I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredibly um, fibrous plant. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was obviously very, very important during that time. So, um, and that's why it, uh, um, most parts of the country, if it's called hemp or hempstead, it used to be hemp. It used to be hempstead, hempshire. I mean, it used to be prolifically hemp, covered hemp here. Yeah. Hemp or hempstead, yes. Um, so initially we grew for fibre, but the problem is, is is really the investment because in order to turn that that crop into a fibrous product like clothes or rope or anything really, you need to process it. And originally it was a very tough um, job for... Uh, it was very laborious, and of course, at the time of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, when it was an agricultural um, society, people um, worked like that because that's how it was. But uh, nowadays, you, you need to have a machine. But there's been no investment in hemp. So, where you, whereas cotton and 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 various other um, fibres are have had 70 years of investment and are now at their peak, um, hemp is really starting from the very beginning. Now, in the 1930s, a Shulton um, brought out a patent for a decorticator that, for the first time, was able to decorticate the fibre. So, basically, what happens is that, is that you cut it down and then you leave it in the field to ret. 
and that breaks it down and makes it mouldy so that you can get to the fibres. But it's, it's a very laborious, long job. And what he worked out was how you could cut it down green and still, you know, um, yeah, um, yeah, separate the fibres and, yeah, and still um, uh, decorticate it. And in 1937, Popular Mechanics brought out an article um, called Hemp, the Billion Dollar Crop, because of this new decorticator, because now you were taking away all the labour, which was the, what the slaves were doing, the black slaves were doing in the fields, because hemp grew prolifically in the United States. I mean, Benjamin Franklin and um, Thomas Jefferson were both hemp farmers, and the American Declaration of Independence was drafted on hemp paper. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Benjamin Franklin had a hemp mill. I mean, hemp was massive in the States, which is what gave them the initial... Um, financial backing to actually get themselves up and running as a country. Um, so basically, uh, this 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 decorse case came out, and the realistic, um, a real realistic hemp for hemp to, and and, and not only hemp but sisal and other plant based products to come onto the market. Um, but it was a big threat to certain industries like um, the oil industry that was starting to come up, and Dupont specifically, who was making up these new synthetic nylons and. And, and, and synthetic uh, cloths like nylon and polyester, which are all oil-based. And um, the cotton industry, and, and, and the big one was the paper industry, because media was starting to become quite big, like the, the printing presses were starting to become um, very modern, and also to be able to print a lot out and, and to get a lot of people um, reading and stuff like that. So suddenly uh, hemp became quite threatened, quite a lot of investment. And so they they got it banned by putting out, in America, by putting out this um, Marijuana Tax Act, which basically taxed farmers to grow marijuana, and then they said they couldn't tell the difference between marijuana and hemp, so it was basically taxing the hemp farmers. Um, and, and hemp farmers like, in everything with agriculture, unless you're given money with subsidy, you certainly can't be paying extra, because then there's no bottom line. So it actually busted all the hemp farmers, and that's what happened. And it went underground, and then with a lot of... Well, the very, the very, the very, the biggest, um, the first ever biggest PR spin was against hemp, and it, basically using the new, the new medium of television, film, and media in the 1950s, hemp was totally demonised um, as reef this, as the, yeah, reefer madness, and it also turns a lot of people onto it as well. But <laughs> on the whole, politically, they used it as an excuse to then totally ban it and for some reason it's, it went completely underground where it has stayed but I feel that was the hemp diva's um, wishes to go underground because had it not have gone underground you would have Monsanto or some big company controlling all of the hemp rights. Genetically modified hemp. Yes exactly and at the moment no one controls hemp and no one wants to touch hemp so that's great. <laughs> And I think that that's why hemp. It's the mother hemp. It's mother hemp. It's it's for community-based empowerment. It's certainly not for um, one big company to come along and take all and cream off the top and keep everyone poor. Hemp is hemp is going to re-empower the planet and and not only re-empower them but really supply communities with the necessary resources that they need in order to be living sustainable lives. And 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 very soon we are going to hit, have to hit that place because we are utilizing and using our resources. Um, at a ridiculous rate and we are whatever happens this whole house of cards that we've built up is ready to blow down and we need to have things in place when it does I don't even it's not an if it really is a when and um, when you're in the Amazon you, you can see it very clearly what it means to live sustainably and how to live sustainably and when you come to the west and you see how unsustainable we're living you know it has to be a finite end because there's yeah. no real flow of of resources or, or respect for Mother Earth. It, 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 it can't continue um, infinitum like this. It has to change, and it's, the change is coming, and it's coming very soon. And so this is why uh, there is an urgency to get it. Well, not an urgency, but there is a people need to become much more empowered and feel that they can be part of something that's going to really help the planet rather than, you know, buying Tesco's and destroy the planet or McDonald's or whatever it is where they're buying. But they don't know. They, they, people aren't realizing that. The power comes from where we spend our money. We have the power, every one of us, but if we spend it in, with companies that are creating um, you know, environmental or social damage, by, by buying their products, we're, we're still feeding that, saying that's okay. 